our presentation today, oops, that is the wrong way, uh, is going to be on the PSIA, Professional Ski Instructors of America, uh, Telemark Fundamentals. And as we talked about in our clinic on this note today, uh, fundamentals are, are relatively new to our organization. Uh, in Ushaya, we, we came away with this idea that we want to have a clear message of what was important to us as an organization and as a nation of skiers. And so what we did is we got together and uh, figured out what our values were and tried to put those into words so that we can uh, explain them, teach them, demonstrate them, and, uh, and uh, ski to them. So uh, another new thing that's come out of our organization is this learning connection model. Uh, what's really great about this uh, concept is that it embodies our teaching philosophy as an American teaching system. And if you look at the diagram here, uh, we have the, the student right in the center. Uh, our organization believes that uh, the student is the center of the lesson. And everything we do is to benefit that relationship. Uh, we actually have what we call the, the student-centered relationship, or student-centered teaching. Uh, and how we apply that is through the instructor's decisions and behavior uh, towards the, the student. And the red triangles there are what make up our lessons. We have our technical skills, which is what we usually work with on the hill. We also have the teaching skills that are important. And uh, new to our system as well, uh, we just created people skills. And we're still working on those, still uh, work to release them. In fact, the Alpine team and the Silver team are giving presentations on that specific content right now. So it's relatively new development. Uh, to our organization, and I know probably no way back there can read that from here. Mm -hmm. uh, not super important that you do. I will say that this content is in that manual right there. Uh, but what is just noting is on the left here, we have our technical skills, and we have a separate set of technical skills or fundamentals for each of our disciplines. And our organization encompasses cross country, adaptive, snowboard, alpine, telemark skiing, and uh, each of those each of those disciplines have created their own set of fundamentals. <coughs> Actually, really interesting if you're here for the cross country one at all. Uh, they just developed a totally new uh, set of fundamentals that's pretty unique, uh, especially to our our nation. And it's a uh, system that looks really different than anybody else's, which is pretty great. Uh, what we're going to focus on today is those technical skills, uh, the teaching skills, people skills as well. All that very important, but our focus currently is just going to be on the scheme fundamentals. And so, how is that? And is that legible at all? You know, today on the snow. Uh, we went over these briefly. We described that we have six fundamentals, uh, six things that we believe are <coughs> present in all good scheme. Uh, and this is very specific to telemark scheme uh, as well. And so just to, uh, what we'll do is, I don't need to read them off right now. As we go through the following slides, uh, we're going to break these down one by one and go over uh, some of the specifics of each of the fundamentals and a little bit of what it looks like. And please, what I would ask is, if you have questions on any material, chime in. If you have conversations point, points to bring up, please chime in. I'd rather have this more of a, a discussion than me just talking at you the whole time. So feel free to put in your content if you have it. It would be great. So demonstrating our values. And demonstrating our values is simply shown in how we, oh man, one, two, three, four, all right. Yeah, so demonstrating our values is simply uh, how we express ourselves in scheme. And like we said in the US, uh, we, we definitely believe in diversity and versatility in our scheme. Uh, we like to see a variety of terrain, a variety of snow conditions. Uh, and that's another uh, underlying focus of the fundamentals is that uh, because they're open and vague to some point, uh, it allows for a diversity of scheme and it doesn't put us uh, say pigeonhole us or put us in um, a, narrowly, a narrow mindset. Uh, we're very open to many kinds of scheme, uh, again, dependent on things such as terrain, uh, student desires, equipment, uh, snow conditions. All those things uh, will be decision makers in how we ski and how we present our fundamentals. So, exploring our values. Uh, fundamental. Uh, control the forward relationship of the center of mass to the base of support to, uh, to manage pressure along the length of the ski. Uh, 
Uh, so basic support is what you stand on. That's for us telemarketers and our telemarketing fans. It's somewhere right underneath our feet or the whole length of the speed. And as we explored today a little bit, uh, we talked about what kind of outcomes you get when you direct pressure differently uh, along the length of your skis. Uh, one of the goals is when you get a little more forward, that intent is going to be a little more carby, get the ski to interact with the snow in a more positive way. Uh, sometimes you might find yourself a little more towards the center to get a different outcome, whether you're trying to skid or if you get to mixed snow conditions. Uh, so some of the aspects of this, uh, we accomplish uh, this movement through flexion and extension of all of our joints. Uh, that allows us to move along the length of the ski one way or the other. Uh, we also can move our feet underneath us or we can move our center mass back and forth. Either one of those is functional depending on what we're trying to do. And as we said on the snow and demonstrated on the snow, uh, this should be a, a continuum. We're never trying to get in one spot in the skis. Uh, it changes from phase of the turn uh, to uh, whatever kind of snow condition or pitch that we're on. Uh, demonstration here, if we get this thing going. <coughs> So low angle groomer, beautiful place to carve. Uh, the intent of this skier here is to move forward towards the tip of the ski and get as much engagement as possible. And we talked about how a, a lot of the fundamentals overlap and that how I can use my beat change to allow my body weight to move forward. That is me by the way. So. Uh, and in the lead change, I'm making that rear foot driving forward and moving my center of mass with it to get as much performance as I can out of the skis. Where is that? By the way, that's Big Sky Montana, uh -huh. and we're doing National Academy in a few weeks, and you're all invited. Yeah, tell them Academy will be at this location in two weeks. All right, so slightly different terrain, slightly different tactics. Uh, steep, kind of cruddy, a little bit of mixed snow, some ice, some good stuff. And if you can watch this gear, depending on how well you can see from back there, uh, this is Grant by the way, uh, not as much pressure towards the front of the ski. What you can see here is the pressure is directed more under the foot and towards the ski uh, laterally, rather than moving all the way towards the tip. Uh, these conditions move towards the tip of the ski, uh, you might find yourself vulnerable to go over the handlebars. Uh, and so we shift our weight because of the, the snow conditions. Good job, Grant. Any questions on 4F? Yeah. And we can we simplify the, the, fun, the fundamentals too. We can say, hey, we're just working on 4F balance there. Control the lateral, and this is a, this is a second one. Uh, Control the lateral relationship of the center of mass to the base of support to manage pressure from ski to ski. And this one's a really interesting concept because uh, when we developed these fundamentals, I think this one was one of the uh, bigger talking points. Uh, we had representatives from all over our division, all over the U.S. country, coming together to help formulate uh, these concepts. And uh, this one was difficult because there was some uh, different beliefs in how we uh, direct pressure in telemark terms. And there is a contingent of us who felt like we are really trying to stay 50-50 from ski to ski throughout the whole term. And there's another train of thought that uh, we try to direct more pressure to the outside ski. And actually what's been really great is watching all of these <coughs> talented skiers this weekend, uh, we can tell that more people are directing pressure to the outside ski, especially as they initiate the turn, but maybe uh, you're changing how much weight you have from one ski to the other, uh, throughout the whole term. And that's one thing we explored on the snow today. And uh, my belief is that for ski performance, we definitely direct pressure <coughs> to the outside ski at initiation, and then we manage it from there. And we manage it in a couple ways, how we align the hip over the feet, and uh, how we lengthen or shorten one leg or the other to put more or less pressure on one ski or the other. Is that readable to anybody? Or no? no? You might recognize this from just the other day. Uh, I think there's a Canadian group that gave us a, a drill to do uh, to move our, to incline to the center of the turn to shift more weight onto the inside ski. Uh, a great drill for telemarketers as far as being able to manage weight from foot to foot. Generally more weight goes to the outside, but here's a way to uh, 
get students or yourself to put more weight towards the inside scheme. And then one of the hopeful results from building the skills in this manner, sorry, y'all like to see Monica speed. It's the hope that we can manage pressure from foot to foot to get both skis to interact with the snow in a positive way and get a lot of performance out of both skis. And the train here, it's, it's something that was groomed <coughs> with a few inches of snow on it. Um, with a few inches of snow, it's definitely difficult to get really far. I definitely had to manage from foot to foot to not to get too far over the handlebars. All right. Another fundamental. Uh, control edge angles through a combination of inclination and angulation. And this is one, at least on my clinic today, that we spent a lot of time on. And uh, I think it's one of the biggest differences that we viewed from one nation to the other is how much their body is inclined to the turn and how much they angulated. And there's definitely a lot of differences uh, that showed up. And what we did explore is, you know, depending on the turn size that you're trying to do, uh, how much are you going to have, uh, how much inclination are you going to have versus angulation, and uh, the turn size, the, the pitch, and the quality of the snow. So, what, what was kind of a, I think an overall image is that a lot of the European countries tend to have more inclination uh, than the North American countries. And I think we can attribute that a lot to terrain that people ski. Uh, it seems like definitely in Slovenia, you're used to skiing a lot more groomers. And the Slovenians were great at uh, showing really uh, productive inclination early in the turn. Uh, Poland had a lot of it, uh, I think Germany even had a lot of it. And because of that, those countries get a lot of ski performance. And inclination early in the turn is a great way uh, to get ski performance early on in the turn. Uh, but what the North Atlantic, what the Canadians, uh, maybe New Zealand a little bit too, and the Americans, uh, we tend to ski a little more angularly. And the train of thought for us is that uh, with mixed snow, uh, with mixed conditions, we want to be in a place where we're more balanced and maybe ski performance isn't as high uh, of, a, of a concern as being balanced over the skis. And just a simple quick clip. <coughs> Nothing too exciting, but just demonstrating at the turn initiation, there is some degree of inclination to initiate and roll over from one set of edges to the next. However, as I move from the apex through the finishing phase of the turn, angulation builds and develops. And to me, it allows me to do a couple things. It allows me to bounce towards the forces of the turn, uh, and it also allows me to easily release and re-engage for the next turn. And this is why I think us as a country we don't encourage a lot of inclination, especially later in the turn, because it makes it more difficult to roll, or to get out of the turn and go to the next one. Uh, and I think it makes it more difficult to manage the forces. <coughs> All right, this is going to go by really quick without any input, just so you know. All right. Control the turning of the skis with rotation of the feet and legs in conjunction with discipline <coughs> in the upper body. And I think, I think this one is, uh, is worded really well in that. Uh, I see all the countries definitely use more steering from the lower body. Uh, there's not a whole lot of the upper body. Though I did hear there's one country that used that as a drill or the way they ski. Uh, Poland definitely talked about initiating with the upper body <coughs> to some extent. Just out of curiosity, is there any other nation that teaches that? At initiation, you use the upper body as a rotational force? No. No. And why don't you? It's <laughs> strange, uh, also for me, when a uh, Polish man uh, have a workshop there, uh -huh. they turn the, the upper body to the, uh, to the hill. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, the, the rear side of the ski is the turn. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially when it's groomed and uh, icy turning. Yeah. Yeah, there's no it, way to do that. It negatively, in, it negatively, negatively affects the performance of the skis on the snow, and they tend to wash out if you do that. Though, I did see the Finnish group sometimes follow their skis quite a bit, and they didn't seem to have much of an issue with it. But uh, there's definitely different degrees to which you can, you can utilize it or, or not. And 
again, as, as terrain changes, as, as things become steeper, as uh, you need to move more down the fall line, uh, we're going to experience more of that counter, more of that separation of the upper and lower body. Uh, pitching around the, on the far side there, uh, the top one is a good interpretation of what happens when you over-rotate the upper body. And it, what it does is it puts body weight into the back seat and towards the tail of the skis. Uh, the second one is a little bit more discipline, upper body spacing in the direction of travel, and anticipating the next turn. Uh, the phrase that I really like about this fundamental is in, with discipline in the upper body. Uh, like I said, there's different degrees of separation that you can have all the time. Uh, sometimes the body may rotate with the feet, but you don't want to use the body to rotate the skis. Uh, but it can follow, again, depending on the performance of the skis that you're looking for and the direction <coughs> that you're trying to travel. You said over-rotate. Is that up for a photo, like kind of over-countered? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it is, uh, uh, if I remember that turn right, uh, it was some kind of funky snow, and I actually twisted my body first in, to try to get my skis to go. Yeah. It actually ended up working out okay, eventually. But. And I believe we had a beautiful demonstration of rotation just the other day. And uh, this is a great skill builder to work with range of rotation. And again, this move the upper body in that the upper body is not the turning force here, uh, but the upper body is moving with the lower body to allow the full <coughs> rotation of the skis. And then this video of Grant and some low angle bumps, no poles, uh, to me this penalizes the discipline of the upper body. Uh, no pole to block his upper body from moving, uh, but just all rotary movements come from the lower body using core muscles to keep the upper body facing the direction he wants to go. And with utilizing skills like that, the hope is you can ski terrain, like this, and come out with the same proficiency. This, by the way, is uh, Oregon. Lots of snow, big trees. And if you, this is Grant skiing this, and if you watch, uh, the upper body movements are super subtle. Uh, the turning movements come from the lower body, and he's able to maintain the discipline of the upper body for the direction he's trying to travel. This is also Mount Bachelor in Bend, Oregon. And I think I talked to somebody about uh, it being some of the best tree skiing in the world. Uh, lots of trees, not a lot of branches. I think it has more tree skiing than most places out there. So, uh, another fundamental for us. Regulate the amount of pressure created through ski snow interaction. And this is another place where we spent a little bit of time today. Uh, we try to create different outcomes in our turns by one being really heavy at the top of the turn, giving the ski a bend and allowing the ski to pull us to the turn and then trying to be light or regulate that pressure at the end of the turn. Uh, then we also had a different tactic where we try to get really light at the top of the turn, uh, unweight our skis, get them off the snow, uh, and then press them in later to get the skis to react. And uh, you know the conditions that we're looking at there, that, that deep powder, uh, to me that's a great place where I need to actually lift and pull my legs up to me uh, so that I can get out of the snow and I have less resistance. It allows me to carry more speed, and uh, it's a lot less work because I'm not moving as much snow around. And uh, the way we can affect the pressure uh, from the skis to the snow, uh, we do that with our joints. Uh, we, we shorten our legs to shorten our joints to absorb terrain. Uh, we lengthen our joints to to build pressure. And this is actually a, uh, a freestyle bump run. It's very deep. Probably isn't as deep as it, it's deeper than it looks. Uh, this is Mount Hood, Oregon in the summer. This is probably July 10th. Yeah. And the intention here is to, is to stay connected to the snow, to roll over the bumps. And you know, one other thing we talked about in our claim today was that how the lead change is actually a, a function of pressure control as well. And as I'm bringing one foot forward, I can shorten the leg to help me roll over the terrain. 
I would argue this is also another good example too of discipline in the upper body. I'm trying to move the lower body without changing the path of the upper body. If you've never skied Mount Hood in the summer in Oregon, you should go. Uh, they're open till the end of September and they reopen in November. So they're closed for one month. <coughs> I will say the advantage to this was it's slushy bumps, so the snow is kind of slow. Okay. Oh. And so just another powder run, and uh, the the idea here is I was trying to maintain a lot of speed over the powder, and so in my transition. <coughs> I was trying to get light and get out of the snow, pull my legs up, and then as I land through the end of the turn, press into the snow to get a platform to bounce off of it. And this is, this is actually exactly what we practice in our group today, is that ability to, <coughs> to get light at turn initiation so that you can maintain speed and deal with difficult snow. This actually wasn't difficult, but... <coughs> And this is uh, our last fundamental. Control the size, the intensity, and the timing of the lead change. <coughs> so um, I feel like uh, watching the, the, the different nations, and that there definitely were different timings in, in the lead change. And if I could ask uh, a representative from Canada, do you have anything that you try to time your lead changing with? Any other skill or any place in the turn where you believe this lead change should happen? <laughs> other than it, it um, smoke, it's relevant to smoke condition. Yep. It's, uh, it's relevant to, um, so let me put it this way, smoke condition, speed, and turn shape. All three of those variables create pressure. And it, and given that we're on that slide right now, um, it or the slide before we were just coming now this one is that it's uh, it's a it's a combination of all those items. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, on longer turns, you know, obviously we're going to see a lead change happen. Perhaps at higher, faster speeds, we're going to see that lead change happen sooner. Get the ski working. Uh, perhaps in slower speeds, uh, especially in, when we're teaching in a progression, we're going to see a little bit more of a skidded. Um, Parallel edge can then move into the into a tall mark stand. Okay. Cool. What about Australia? Do you try to time lead change with any other factor? <coughs> uh, it just depends on the snow condition and what kind of performance. <laughs> Slower speed, steer turn. Yeah. You start moving. And our, our system is such too is that we'd like to directly time the lead change with the edge change. In that if you are doing bigger GS style carved turns, uh, that edge change happens really early in the turn. And thus that lead change can happen well above the fall line and early in the turn. Uh, as you get to mixed conditions uh, or more pivoties type turns, where that edge change might happen lower down the hill, lower down the fall line, uh, well then those feet may not pass until lower down the fall line. So yeah, depending on type of turn or performance of the ski. Uh, it's going to change, uh, but we definitely do like to time it with our, our edge change. Uh, and we find that it's even what's really cool is that the, the movement from one tunnel walk stance to the next, moving that outside foot forward, uh, that actually helps facilitate that change and instead of just timing it with. Uh, it allows us to help cross our, our, our center of mass order and release one set of edges and hopefully engage the next set. Gus, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you just dive into a little bit more um, intensity? Yeah. Uh, so intensity is the amount of, of effort. I think somebody today used the word power. Driving. Uh, yeah, exactly. So how much force you're, you're putting into it. And I think you kind of, you just described it yourself. Uh, when we're doing uh, what we call a basic turn, <coughs> a low angle turn, low end without a whole lot of force, uh, you know, we're, we're being very easy. Uh, but when you are uh, in a GS course racing, uh, you're going to throw that foot forward, one, with speed, but with a lot of intensity, uh, because you know that you're going to start to deal, you're gonna start to deal with a lot of forces coming at you. Uh, throughout that turn. And that's, you know, the picture here we're looking at, uh, we see Grant there in a GS style turn, and he's got a long uh, length of lead. 
Uh, it's, because, it's because he's dealing with a lot of horses, and so you need more stability. So opening up that stance is, is great. Uh, my gear, I'm in the fall line pretty much in a powdery bump run. I'm in the fall line and my feet haven't passed each other yet. Uh, to me, I'm trying to keep things a little bit tighter, a little bit smaller, uh, because I have to be a little bit quicker and I'm not going to get as spread out in that. Yeah. And uh, we actually have a, a saying or a, a, a terminology in PSIA called DIRT. It's an acronym for duration, intensity, rate, and timing. And all of our movements that we make uh, and apply one of those or the other. And so the duration is, you know, how long are you spreading out your lead change? Does it take a short amount of time or does it take a long amount of time? Uh, when are you doing the turn and what's the pacing of it as well? Sorry? Yeah? What <laughs> is the size of the lead change? The size is the length. Oh, uh, so when why you're... don't you use the length? <laughs> short or long? Okay. Yeah. Why don't you use this word instead? What word? The length instead of <coughs> the size. That's a great question. I, I know we had a discussion about that. If anyone can remember why we use size versus length, I can't remember. Yeah. We sat around for three days and talked about this. Yeah. But that's great. And actually, like I said, these, these are new to us. This is our third season with these fundamentals. And it's good for us to have these questions come up. And if we can't answer them appropriately, well, then maybe we should go back and look at it. Sorry, dur yeah. uh, duration, intensity, rate, rate. And it is rate related to the pace. Mm -hmm. pace. Thank yeah. you. How often? Oh, how often? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think that was originally written as dit, and dit didn't sound good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did that a very long time ago. <laughs> yeah. The other reason we might come into play is uh, <laughs> that. The reason we want the size instead of length is because length could also be the length of time. Yeah. So, size is a, a, a good word for distance. Makes you safe. Is it for time duration? Length of time duration. Yes. Yeah. And so, in a tighter bump run, the lead change is sped up, the lead change is short and tight uh, because we don't have the time to spread it out and make the next turn. This is Breckenridge, Colorado. It's always sunny there. And then just the, uh, on the opposite side, more of a GS style turn. The lead is lengthened. And also, uh, because of the time and space that the skier has, uh, the rate or the intensity uh, of how the ski comes forward can be a little bit less. Uh oh, I didn't put that on the Greg, today you talked about also, in a way, when it's something to the fact of lead changes moving into a balanced stance, is that correct? Yeah, uh, I, I personally, and hopefully as an organization, as an organization, we like to define the tower as a, uh, a movement that allows us to create stability, uh, create more F balance, and also allows us to control pressure. Uh, and I think most people know this, and one of the main reasons why we telemark or, or have this lead change and have this stance is that we're trying to create stability and pre heel equipment. All right, so that being our last fundamental. Uh, this is actually our fundamental uh, slide and organized very specifically in this manner in that we don't really value one fundamental over the other. Uh, there's no order, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, you can start at any point and work with any of these. Uh, so it is more uh, in a circle rather than linear. And I will say that we do have lead change in the center. Uh, I'd say mainly because it's what separates our sport from, from other disciplines. What, it's what makes us unique on the hill. Uh, and also the lead change is and uh, does affect every other fundamental out there. And I think it's really important to, to understand that correlation, uh, how that movement can affect the pressure in the skis, uh, the way you edge your skis, the way you rotate your skis. And that is it. That is all we have. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions at all? Actually, the question is, uh, I have for anybody is, is, is uh, yeah. does going through the slideshow help solidify any information we did on the, on the hill today? Yeah. Yeah.
One question about the early chains and the chains. Does, does the uh, e chains happens always before a change, or does it uh, uh, change according to terrain or snow condition or? How, the, how do you the, see? the hope is that they are simultaneous movements. Uh, they, they occur. I see this. The, the lead change occurs during the edge change, and so as I start to move one foot forward, that action has also helped me release the skis. All right, and, to, and then as I'm moving through and passing, then I'll go on to a new set of edges. Now uh, that is what we'd say in good telemark skiing. Granted, there are tons of drills out there yeah. where we might we might change those. We might separate the timing of the lead change and the edge change uh, to focus on one skill set or the other. Because I've heard the uh, concept called modern mark yeah. kind of skiing, which yeah. is uh, you know, well, totally one, different what we are to you, what the telemark yeah. here, yeah. is here in North Northern. One way to think about this um, is that, you know, if you looked at all of these as like a pressure thing, right? Like yeah. one way to look at the lead change, why we have a foot in front of the other, is so that we don't go over the handlebars, you know, Sorry, uh, we, so we don't fall forward, yeah, okay, right? Yeah. Um, and so when I go like this with the edges, it increases the surface area, the pressure on the ski, and I'm more likely to pitch forward. So the time when they pass is when the least amount of pressure is, yeah. right? So when I watch a, a snowboarder or a alpine skier as well as telemarker, a lot of times they try and lessen the pressure at edge change. Right? Yeah. So one way to think of the edge is increase, decrease. So when the feet pass, I'm a little vulnerable to pitching forward. So I want to be on, I want that to happen at a time to where I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have something that's going to knock me forward. So it's, it's not the way, but it's one way of thinking of it. Okay. You know, there's not much pressure when I'm ready to ch change. Did I answer your question? Well, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so you don't separate that idea so that the, uh, so strongly about the uh, you you need to make the early uh, change before you can uh, make the uh, change, or you have to do the uh, edge change before the change. So you don't, as a concept, you, you they, they happen as a in good way, uh, in, in good skiing, yes. Uh, and, and again, just to reiterate, uh, to test instructors, to test skills, we will make them separate them. You okay. might have people lead change first, yeah. and then go ahead and do that. And it's to test your ability to change the timing of one or the other. Okay. Uh, but when we start linking good quality telemark turns yeah. together, uh, the best result is when you time edge and lead change together. Yeah. So it's, you, we definitely all have the ability to change them, and we have another thing we call the, the delayed lead change, where we allow them to roll to an edge and then maybe we'll lead change after that. And that again is just showing, uh, to us it shows an instructor's or a student's ability to work one skill over the other and separate them. But then hopefully when we come back to our, our good scheme, uh, we can also make them simultaneous. But we, you can get, you'll get different results on the skis when you try to separate them and change the timing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we do utilize it, but it's not what, when we, when we think of good schemes, we want them simultaneous. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's good. Yeah. Opinion. If you, what do you think? If you ta timeize the lead change, mm -hmm. you change skiers um, rhythm, speed, and the size of the turn. Mm -hmm. So if you say we need a later lead change, it's a longer term. If you make him to do the uh, quicker lead change, it's a smaller turn. So I think it's not collaborated with the time when to do it. It mm -hmm. depends on the skier's way that he wants to ski. If there's a big, small, quick or a slow turn. There are uh, often, and uh, this can be separated again, but there's often a rotational component when doing a lead change. And typically when we're bringing that foot forward, we're bringing it around in an arc. So if we are doing the lead change sooner and faster, the tendency is to cut to a shorter turn, like you're saying. Uh, but we can also, um, we can change the timing so that we do spread it out. And like I said, if you, if you slow down this moment, movement, you're also slowing down the rotational movement, and then you're going to end up in a, in a larger radius turn as well. Yeah. So depending on turn outcome, this happens sooner or um, quicker rather, versus slower. 
Uh, but there's a train of thought too. Like if, uh, a lot of the racers, uh, they have a lead change where they will lead change really quick at the top of the turn, and they try to get to a stable telemark stance because they know as they're traveling fast and moving down the fall line, they're going to pick up a lot of momentum and deal with a lot of forces. So they want to be in that telemark stance already. Uh, so they are still timing edge change and lead change together, uh, but they haven't added a rotational force yet uh, because they still want to get as much performance out of the skis as they can. So they're letting the side cut of the ski pull them through the turn rather than this rotational force pull them through the turn. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Do you guys have your own manual? Yes. Uh, and on that note, we do have a telemark manual. I believe it is seven or eight years old. Five. 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 Okay. Five. Okay. Yeah, we do have our own telemark manual, and if you are interested in looking at it for the next two weeks, uh, on the first page of this, there is a QR code that you can scan, and that will take you to our website and to a link where you can access all of our educational material until April 12th. Yep. Yeah, until April 12th. So if you're a fast reader, you can probably get through everything. Uh, and again, we do have a technical manual for, for telemark, for alpine, for board, cross country, Adaptive, freestyle, children's, uh, and just this season we came out with a brand new uh, teaching uh, manual as well, uh, which is a really beautiful, well done <coughs> manual. Awesome. I'm trying to think what other, and we uh, yes. does it give me access to the Matrix too? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a thing on our website called the Matrix, which is a series of, of uh, skill videos of, of our skiers going through a bunch of different tasks and different turns, and so you can get a really great idea of, of the imagery that we're trying to present for our nation. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.